Good morning, everyone. My name is Sheila Coronel. I am Dean of Academic Affairs of the Journalism School. I'm also the director of the Stabil Investigative Reporting Program. Welcome, everyone. How many of you have come from New York? All right. Mm -hmm. From outside New York? Oh, quite a few. Thank you for making the trek from outside the US. Wow. You came all the way here, so thank you. And welcome, welcome everyone. This is um, Pulitzer Hall. It's um, the building that houses the Graduate School of Journalism. It's named after our founder, Joseph Pulitzer, who, as you probably know, it was a publisher dating back to the late 1800s. His newspaper was called The World. He was a Hungarian immigrant. And he came into the New York publishing scene and completely disrupted everything. He was what you would call in modern day times a business disruptor by setting up a newspaper that was popular, that had illustrations and photographs, and that uh, catered to the new audiences that were coming here. also housed here in the school. Hundred six class that uh, that were graduate from our. We have a, we have our alumni are spread out. There it is. Our alumni are it's magic. <laughs> <laughs> our alumni are spread out around the U.S. and around the world. If you come to the journalism school, you'll be part of a um, very closely knit body of former students who walked down these halls and taken classes from us. I will. Um, we have different programs, including our latest program, which we will start offering this year. We have a new three-semester degree in data journalism. It's designed for journalists or non-journalists or for people who have no experience but want to learn both journalism and the craft of data-driven journalism. The classes begin in the summer, starting in May next year. And you graduate. this class will graduate with the rest of our MA and MS students um, the May the following year. So it's a one year, three semester program and we can tell you more about it. It's our newest program and I urge you to look at our website if this is something of interest to you. We have been working on this new degree for a few years. Right now we have a data concentration which is a two semester data, uh, data focused program in our Master of Science program. But we have learned from teaching our data concentrators and it's and we are now, you know, we, we, it's like a hyped up, very much cutting edge degree. And I urge you to look at it because you may not consider it. We have people coming into our data concentration after they've enrolled in the MS program and they discover that it is something they love. So if you want to talk to us more about what data journalism means and what it entails, please feel to do so and please consider it in your application. So we have, three programs here in the school. We're a graduate school. We don't have an undergraduate degree. Uh, most of our students go into the Master of Science program. It's a two semester program. It's intended for students who have no experience in journalism or have some journalism experience. Its focus is on teaching the craft of journalism as well as law, ethics, and higher level skills including audio, video, data, long form narrative journalism. How many of you here are interested in the MS or the Master of Science program? That's great. Um, how many of you are interested in the part-time Master of Science program? Good, so our Elena Cabral, who's the administrator of that program, will talk more about it. We also have a smaller program intended for journalists, for those who already have journalism experience, 
but one to hone their knowledge and expertise in reporting on subject matter. That is our Master of Arts program. And we have four concentrations, MA Politics. Sandro Stile is a professor in that concentration and he'll talk more about it. So it's politics, business and economics, arts and culture, and science, health, and the environment. How many of you are interested in the MA program? Good. Are there anyone here, is there anyone here interested in our PhD program? No? Okay, if, should you change your mind, Christine Souders is at the back of the room, and she would be happy or if you, a PhD is in your horizon, somewhere in the near future, please see Christine here at the back of the room. So it's my pleasure today to welcome you, but also to introduce members of our faculty who will tell you more about our program. So I introduce Elena Cabral. She's, um, she w graduate, what class, Elena? Uh, 99. Class of 99. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, yes, I am a graduate of the class in 1999. I went on to work for the Miami Herald, an internship that I got through uh, Columbia. Um, and uh, returning to New York City, I've worked in uh, magazines. Um, I was an editor at Scholastic News. Uh, I began teaching again at, at Columbia. Now I run the part-time program, and I also work in the Department of Career Services. Um, which puts on the uh, biggest journalism job fair anywhere. And uh, hopefully you'll hear a little bit more about that later, but I'm happy to answer questions about it as well. Um, Elena, can I introduce the others? Oh, sure. Okay. Sandro, Sorry. class of? 1983. Class of 1983. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, sure. I um, came here and began working as uh, an intern, summer intern at Newsweek. Um, I then left there. I began doing legal journalism while I was at Newsweek and then got a job as a, as a full-time writer at a place called the National Law Journal. And then I uh, started working on my first book and quit my job in order to finish that and became a freelance writer. I did that for 18 years or so and produced, uh, uh, I think, four books in that period when I was kind of minding my own business. and. Nick Lemon became dean here and recruited me to um, teach in this new program, the MA program that I still teach in, and I'll tell you about it when I give my presentation. Mm -hmm. Susan McGregor. Um, hi, my name is Susan McGregor. Uh, I'm an assistant professor uh, teaching mostly in the Master of Science program, um, and I'm also the assistant director of something called the Tau Center for Digital Journalism, um, which does a lot of research and organizing of events here at the Journalism School. I'd be happy to talk more about that later. Um, my specialties, uh, I actually came to the Journalism School from the Wall Street Journal, um, where I was the senior programmer on the news graphics team. So. Um, was sort of in the early days of doing interactive graphics on the web, and here I teach um, in data journalism, visualization, um, and do research on information security issues for journalists. So before I hand over the floor to members of our faculty, <coughs> I'd just like to say that there has never been, and I really mean this, there's never been a more exciting and important time to do journalism. The press as an institution of democracy is under attack, as you know, from various forces and the discipline of journalism, journalism as the discipline of verification is never more important it is, as it is now. So we have been teaching journalism and the craft and discipline of verification for over 100 years. I'd like to end this presentation by quoting from our founder, jo Joseph Pulitzer, who said, our republic and its press will rise or fall together, an able, disinterested, public-spirited press with trained intelligence, and this is why he put up money to, to set up the journalism school. He said, we need a press with the trained intelligence to know the right and courage to, um, to call, to hold people to account without which popular government is a sham and mockery. So I leave you with the words of our founder and our professors here. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sheila. Uh, my name is Christine Souders. I'm the Associate Dean for Admission and Financial Aid. I'd like to welcome you all here um, again as well and to say thank you to all of our faculty for being here on such a beautiful day. Um, I know that all of you are taking your time to do this. Um, so I'm going to 
ask Elena to start first um, to talk a little bit about the MS program, the how the, the course structure, um, and and to talk a little bit about both the ten month um, full time MS program as well as the part time program, and then um, we'll talk a little bit also with Susan about. Um, some of the, the data programs and how they're structured here, um, as well as the dual degree program in computer science and journalism. Mm -hmm. And then we'll move to uh, Sandro, who will speak with us about the MA program. And we will have time for questions at the um, end of the faculty panel, so um, write down your questions. Mm -hmm. Elena. Great, thank you. Um, the MS program, hopefully you've read a little bit about it online. There's a lot of information there that about the course break breakdown, so I won't go too deeply into that. But I will tell you that with all of the various programs, options, um, technology that we have built up over the course of this 100 years, and particularly in the last 10 or 15 years, this the MS program is really very much about discovery, preparation, and, and choices. From the time you make this application, you're making a lot of choices about the type of journalism you'd like to do, and this program is very wide-ranging so that you can very much, um, through the course of fulfilling the requirements, uh, shape your own curriculum. What do I mean by that? I've, uh, our, our, our curriculum is very much grounded in fundamentals such as reporting and writing. This is something that uh, students all have to take, two separate classes. but. Uh, in doing so, uh, should you have an interest in video, audio, data, um, or subject areas such as education, writing, religion, um, business writing, there will be offerings for you to choose from to help uh, cultivate that interest. And so uh, in the first semester, you're taking a full load of this reporting, writing class. You're taking fundamental classes in law ethics, the history of journalism, the business side of journalism, uh, and you're starting also your capstone project, which is called the master's project, and that too can be done in a variety of ways, uh, either through um, print, a combination of print and video, um, a long-form audio piece like the kind you, you'd hear on This American Life, for example, um, or a photo essay. Um, and of course, if you're going in through the data track, uh, you're learning about writing, writing about writing with uh, about data, and um, certainly how to find it, clean it, analyze it, uh, visualize it for your reader. So lots of different options there. And the good news is that you don't have to decide right away. Uh, the MS program, it, even in the 10 month uh, uh, space, has a lot of time worked in to figure out. <coughs> what direction you're headed, and to think of your reporting professors as your uh, mentors in that regard, and certainly um, staff such as myself in career services to uh, to ask about which courses to take. It's a full class load, which is um, why our uh, full-time students don't work and don't necessarily do internships, although they are available. Uh, this being the media capital of the world, there's a lot to choose from. Uh, but in general, most of our part-time students really think of this, I mean, full-time students really think of this as a, uh, a professional school in every sense of the word, so that every story they do, um, every p piece of training they do is very much transferable right into the newsroom. But it's uh, there's a lot waiting for you after you graduate. Ten months is really a remarkable amount of time to uh, to get the skills that you need and to also hear from um, media uh, leaders in, uh, and thought leaders vis-a-vis uh, uh, a wide range of lectures, talks, workshops, um, and networking uh, that happens here, even the opportunity to meet the uh, Pulitzer jurors. The part-time program is very much the same degree, um, same, same requirements, but spread over a two-year period. So it starts with a summer fall and spring, and then another summer, fall and spring, and yes, it is the same application uh, period. I graduated from the part-time program myself, um, so I can tell you that it is also very much a period of uh, preparation and um, discovery and choices. Um, 
uh, the perk for me was to have that student status for a period, a longer period of time, and to make use of all of the resources here at Columbia for a longer period of time. Most of our part-time workers, uh, part-time students, do work full-time. Some of them work part-time. Some of them do internships. The career changers um, will, you know, fill their time with internships as they're studying. Some choose to accelerate after the first summer that they're here and graduate in three semesters. So there's a lot of flexibility there, um, and uh, certainly a lot of things going on in the building beyond the coursework that requires of both part-time and full-time students all of your attention. It goes by so quickly. And um, as with anything, you know, it's not just about what you're learning in the classroom, but how you're applying it into this great laboratory that is New York City. Uh, that is where you learn to apply these skills and in real time. And certainly right now, as Dean Cornell pointed out, it, it is one of the most exciting uh, periods to be in, in uh, a journalist in New York City. And hopefully our students will be able to explain that a little further when they get to you. So I'm gonna pass it along and, and uh, we'll hopefully have a little time for Q&A. Uh, thank you, Elena. Um, so um, I guess I'll just say a few words about um, our data program and also our dual degree um, in computer science and journalism, which I also help advise. I was remiss in not mentioning that earlier. Um, so I think just to say a few words about the data offerings at the school, um, I think it's uh, one of the exciting things is that um, we have redeveloped the curriculum over the past several years so that data is available to students in every program. So this semester, for example, I'm teaching um, an, uh, an essentials class in the Master of Arts program. So our Master of Arts students are getting data and analysis and acquisition skills, um, information about how to use data for reporting. Um, likewise, I'm teaching a data one module, and that module is one of the ones that a Master of Science student can take um, uh, in the second half of the fall or in the spring, depending on how they choose to distribute it, um, which again focuses on the essentials of how to uh, locate data, evaluate it, clean it, and do reporting with it. Um, and so I think that's, and then on top of that, we also have our data concentration and beginning next year, um, our three semester data program. Um, the exciting thing about that three semester program is that um, by starting in the summer, there is a set of, it's a custom, completely custom curriculum um, that goes on during the summer, uh, during the summer months and really uh, does a deep dive into a lot of the most current um, aspects of kind of data analysis and data science. So in that summer semester, you're gonna get an, introdu an introduction to things like machine learning, um, and data visualization and analyzing algorithms and programming. Um, and it's a really exciting course um, and I think will really uniquely set up those students who then will enter the MS program um, along with our other, the, uh, the rest of our cohort um, to do reporting and writing and really be able to infuse um, the rest of their MS program with that expertise. Um, so I think it's a really exciting option and definitely one um, that I encourage you all to consider even if you don't have a background in either journalism or data analysis. Um, that summer program was designed particularly for people who don't have a background um, in uh, you know math or uh, engineering or anything like that, right? So um, it's an adaptation of a program that we've had um, going for several years now called the LEAD program, which actually um, was originally conceived in part to help um, prepare students for our dual degree in computer science and journalism. Um, so the LEAD program is a one semester or optionally two semester program that begins in the summer and um, can continue in the fall. It's a certificate program, um, which uh, uh, again is designed specifically to help uh, bring human give humanities majors or sort of hu people who have a background in the humanities the skills that they need in order to either do kind of data visualization and data science at a more general level or if they continue that second semester to actually prepare them to enroll in a master's degree in computer science. Um, 
So it's a really exciting uh, program um, that's very, very unique. There's actually nowhere else that I know of that has offered anything like this. Um, and uh, we do have many students. We have several students, actually, who have gone from that program into our dual degree in computer science and journalism. Um, and that degree is a two-year degree. Um, it, is, um, it is a STEM qualifying degree. You know, that's sometimes a question that folks have. Um, it is a complete Master of Science from both the School of Journalism and the School of Engineering here at Columbia. Um, and as I like to tell our students, you know, that means you get all the benefits of both. So um, Columbia Engineering, as many of you may know, is an extremely well-regarded program. Obviously, Columbia Journalism is uh, I'm going to say the most prestigious program in the world. I'm just going to say that. Um, and so, um, so we have students from that that go on to a wide range of things. We have students who go on um, to do more traditional technology roles, who go on to places like Google and Facebook and things like that. We have students who go into newsrooms or news development um, at places like Bloomberg, the New York Times. Um, and um, it's a very unique program. It's a small program. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we, we try to give those students a lot of personal attention. They have some customized courses that are available for them. Um, and again, it's a really exciting opportunity for anyone who's interested in sort of really pushing the envelope and thinking about what advances in engineering and data science um, can do for journalism. Um, and I will stop there, but I'm happy to answer any questions. And I'll also mention I was at the um, <laughs> Online News Association conference yesterday for an alumni reception that we did um, in the evening. And one of um, our graduates, I think from the first class, Nick Ubell, oh, yeah. was there. And I asked him what he was doing. Um, and he said that he's at, now at Harvard Business School because he's decided that he's going to sort of focus all of his energies on the business side of media um, while making use of everything that he has learned through his degree programs here. So that's another opportunity. We do have students who do become interested also in the business side. Um, and there are people here who can help students who are interested in going in that direction as well. Um, Sandro. And Sandro, if you could talk both about the MA and then maybe say a few words too about the Journalism of Ideas course that you teach for the MS students as well. Sure, because um, <clears throat> I'm familiar. I teach in both the MS and the MA, and <clears throat> so I can maybe give you a little bit of a um, sense of comparison between the two. Um, as you sort of gathered, the MS program is really meant to give people the full complement of skills that they would need to function at a professional level in a journalism job should they not have prior experience. And that means not reporting everything from reporting and writing to <clears throat> um, how to do audio, how to edit video, um, how to handle a camera, um, uh, and increasingly data. And data is now, um, as Susan said, part of both programs. The MA program instead was designed um, for, uh, initially actually we thought it was going to be um, a second year program uh, in many cases for people who had done the MS program and wanted to stay for a second year, but it ended up evolving into a program for people who generally been working for anywhere from two to three to 10 years. Um, who uh, knew how to report and write stories, so they didn't need that kind of training, but they were looking for an area of specialization. They were looking to try and take a quantum leap in their, in their own work and professional lives. Um, some of you may have had the experience if you've been working for a paper. I, I feel like I've written the same story seven times, and I know there's a better way to do this, but I don't have time to figure out what it is because I have a deadline tomorrow or next week. And so I think this program, helps you um, uh, sort of take a step back and rethink how you do stories. Um, as uh, I think Sheila explained, there are four different, the way it's organized is there are four different areas of concentration, which could be arts and culture, business and economics, um, uh, science, technology and the environment, and uh, politics and government, which is the one that I teach in. And it's much more focused on content uh, and subject area expertise. Um, it is an interdi interdisciplinary program so that we have faculty and other departments that come in for 
um, usually half of the classes or something close to half of the classes to explain what they do to students in this area so that, uh, for example, the people doing the science will have a section on physics and a section on biology. They'll learn how uh, you know, genetic microscopes work so that you're then, if you're reporting on that, you can really uh, report with some command um, of your area. The people in business do. Uh, they complain about it, but then years later thank us uh, for having uh, taken um, um, corporate finance and uh, accounting, which means they can actually analyze a, um, a balance sheet and you don't have to just sort of take for granted um, what the public relations department of this or that corporation tells you about, oh, things are going great. Well, what's this item in your, in your annual report that doesn't quite uh, jibe with that? Um, in the politics curriculum, we have um, uh, people from po uh, political science, uh, economics, law, um, sociology, anthropology who come in and talk about what they do and help people think differently about uh, social and political problems that um, you, you think you sort of know about from reading the newspapers, but there is a whole world of research and ideas that I think help you um, uh, think about things in a, in a more sophisticated and deeper way. We've had incredibly good luck with the people that have come through the program who've gone on to do really exceptional um, work out in the field. And uh, so I'm very, very happy with, um, uh, with that. Also, I should say, I've been doing this from the beginning of the program, and I have to say, at the moment, it works very, very well. The first years, we were kind of getting a lot of things right and, and trying to sort of get some kinks out of the program. I think we have it as a, it's a very kind of well-run machine. One of the innovations that we did, and Susan is, is teaching in that, is we realized it was even though <coughs> the MA program is less skills-oriented, we felt we couldn't not um, uh, take stock of the data revolution, and we needed to incorporate that into the curriculum, and so we now have a data investigative um, um, uh, skill set that's required of the students, and the early reports on that, we've been doing it for a few years, as it's, it's starting to work very, very well, and people are very happy um, that they've done that. Um, then, um, since you asked, um, in the spring I teach um, in the MS program, a, a course called the Journalism of Ideas, and um, that essentially involves trying to look for <coughs> um, a kind of potential in news stories that often doesn't get uh, fully examined. So a, a good example, <coughs> just from recent press after the um, uh, after the Las, Las Vegas uh, massacre, the Washington Post did a good story about, you know, why is the U.S. have such a different attitude toward guns and gun ownership than other societies. You're looking at a kind, they're kind of why stories rather than, um, you know, what happened, how many people were killed, and, you know, how did this guy get his guns, all of which are important stories, but they're different in nature than ideas kinds of stories. Uh, one little innovation, I think it's something that we're all doing on the faculty, I realized as I was um, uh, myself listening to more and more podcasts and increasingly impressed at how what good journalism uh, is happening in the podcast universe, and I realized that so many of the podcasts I was listening to were basically ideas podcasts. Some of you, whether you listen to This American Life or Hidden Brain or Invisibilia, Malcolm Gladwell's Revisionist History. Um, and so I actually modified the course last year and um, made it a hybrid course so in the second half of the, of the class people do um, uh, a podcast uh, based on an idea story. And so I think we're seeing, as all of us try to kind of adapt to the, the very rapidly changing environment that we're in, um, making courses that um, are appropriate to the time we live in and uh, that give you, we hope, um, an interesting set of options um, uh, when you finish. And then I also am available for questions. And if you want to write to me or the other, if you're interested in, you know, business, um, the technology, arts and culture, they're mm -hmm. individual professors you should feel free to write to who will be happy to um, give you more specific answers about their areas of concentration. Thank you all. I want to take a couple minutes um, for questions. First of all, I would like to just 
apologize to people who are listening on the live stream. We're aware, we've been made aware that there is a sound delay. Um, we unfortunately can't fix that unless we stop um, and start the live stream over again, which we don't want to do at this point. Um, so I hope that, that you'll all be able to continue with us. Um, and let's now take some questions. If any of you have questions that you would like to pose to the faculty members, please come up to the microphone. We're using mics um, partially because of the live stream so that people can hear the comments and questions as well. Uh -oh. Hang on one second. Hey, there you go. My name is Joldas. I'm from Kazakhstan. This is a country in Central Asia. And my, uh, the, my country government sent me to study uh, in the United States to do especially to the data journalism. So that's why I'm here in New York City. Uh, my question is to Professor M McGregor. Um, according to data journalism, uh, my financial aid, which is the Kazakh government is, is paying for that, uh, they're going to pay for me two years of study of master's degree, but you said that data journalism is a one year around studies, right? Is there, is there a possible ways of uh, scheduling two years of study uh, according to the data journalism, especially specifically in the field of financial data? Thank you. Um, that's a great question. Um, I'm not actually sure what the what the scheduling options are for that. You mean for that three semester data program? Yes. Um, I'm actually not sure what the, I, I can almost guarantee um, that the summer would need to be done in that summer. Um, I'm not sure there might be options for doing the remainder of the Master of Science um, as, as a part-time program. Um, but I think that's something that probably um, I can, I can actually can help, help you a little with. bit with that question. What my suggestion would be is that you apply to the data journalism program. That's a 12-month program that starts at the end of May and runs into the following May. Um, and then if you're looking for an extension and you have an interest in financial journalism, my recommendation would be to apply to the business MA program. So to do what um, uh, Professor Stilla was, was saying that, that we had originally <coughs> envisioned for the MS and MA program is to do both programs. The, the problem is the, the government is uh, looking for the only one program. Got it. Yes. Why don't you and I speak about that? Um, Although also, right, Christine, one possibility would just be to do a normal MS degree with a concentration in data and then do the business M MA because they were originally conceived to actually uh, succeed one another. So I think it's reasonable to say it's actually one program. Mm -hmm. um, you're getting two degrees, but you're getting uh, both a grounding in, in data in the MS and then you're getting the specialization in, um, in business in the MA. So I think that would be an extremely mm -hmm turbocharged education if you got it um, so it's a it would yeah be a great let's talk let's talk about that because I think there are some possibilities but we should talk about what they are and how they might work Thank you. and Taryn Almanzar our director of financial aid and admissions is approaching the microphone mm -hmm. which means she has something to tell us yes it's actually a question from one of our um, live stream uh, people she's uh, Francesca from the Philippines right and she has a question regarding the Stabil program. She wants to know what is the ideal student for that program and what kind of skill sets they should have. Well, I um, wish Sheila were still here. <laughs> well, the, uh, she is. I can, oh, good. Oh, well, there she is. is. Very hardworking, as I think uh, <laughs> is, the, is, the, is, the, is the short answer. Very cu she and curious. Sheila Coronel is going to come back up. Um, Sheila is also the director of the Stabil program in investigative journalism. Sheila, maybe you'd like to yeah, just join yeah. the, the yeah. faculty panel. Um, and so she'll be able to answer that question. So um, thank you for that question. And you know, I didn't put her up to it, even if she's from the <laughs> Philippines. Sheila is also from the Philippines. 
So, um, yes, what we are looking for students who have patience, persistence, and passion for digging. If you want to do breaking stories, the investigative program is not for you. If you're mainly focused on honing your writing skills, I would suggest you go to the a regular MS program, but if you want to dig into public records, if you want to know how to do investigative interviews, if you want to hold wrongdoers to account, if you want to make, you know, expose wrongdoing by individuals and institutions, then the investigative report, reporting program is for you. We teach you how to uncover wrongdoing using journalistic techniques such as digging into public records, looking at databases, doing data analysis, doing interviews, um, field work, observation, et cetera, et cetera. And the new range of techniques available to investigative journalists now is quite immense. And there is around the world a growing community of investigative journalists who are collaborating with each other to do cross-border investigative reporting on issues such as organized crime, corruption, environmental damage, um, social issues such as immigration, um, conditions of women and children, refugees, et cetera, et cetera. Great, thank you, Sheila. And for those of you on the live stream, please feel free to um, let us know what your questions are via the chat. Um, Edwin Isaac from our office is um, moder monitoring and moderating the chat, um, and so we'll be glad to make sure that your questions get asked and answered. Yes. Hello, I'm Joanne Mohed. I came from Dubai, um, and my question today is about the specialization in documentary for the MS program. So I, I didn't hear anyone talk about it, so I was just wondering how it works. I, I can talk about that as well. So we have two um, special concentrations in our Master of Science program. One is in the investigative reporting program, which I already talked about, and the second is in documentary. And this is a three-semester program that starts in September or August and ends in May. Uh, no, and ends in uh, September. September. In September. So it's three semesters. You join the regular MS students in the first two semesters, but taking special classes in video production and documentary production. And then you work on your video documentary in the summer semester when the rest of the MS program have already graduated. So you actually graduate in October or actually in December, we have a special reception for you at the other end of the hall. We have a documentary festival where we show your films and we invite people from the industry. A lot of, a lot of our documentary students have managed to get their documentaries aired. A couple of them have won Emmys. Some of them have, have them aired in like s news sites like Vice or the New York Times. They've done, they've done really, really well and are now in very successful careers doing documentary um, filmmaking. Yeah. Thank you. I should also mention in speaking about documentary and, and video and that sort of thing, our offerings in video and audio are also very, very robust. Um, we have wonderful faculty teaching in those programs. So even if there are people who are in the general concentration in the MS, you have the opportunity if you are thinking that you're, you have an interest in broadcast journalism or um, television, radio journalism, that kind of thing, you can absolutely get the training that you need here to go into that kind of journalism. Um, and I, I'll also mention just something that, that um, Myra Lowe, who is one of our graduates, um, said to me at the reception at ONA last night, she said, you know, I started as a print journalist and then I went to, as a newspaper journalist, I went to magazine and um, she went to digital and she's now at CNN. So she's really gone through all of the different types of platforms and that is not at all unusual uh, for that to happen to J school graduates. And it's for that reason that the MS program is designed to train you in all of these areas so that you have the skills to make those transitions when it becomes appropriate for you in your careers. Thanks for your question. Hello, good morning. My name is Maria Hurley from Brooklyn, New York. And I w my question was, um, so I originally was interested in the data journalism program, but I heard Professor Cabral talk about the education writing. I just wanted to know a little bit more background about the education writing courses. Sure. Um, 
you know, and there are also in, uh, courses that you can take in an investiga an investigative uh, journalism as well, uh, if you sort of fall somewhere uh, uh, in the realm of what um, Dean Cornell was describing, but maybe don't have a lot of experience and want to get that grounding too. The education reporting class was taught by a, uh, someone who I think is probably one of the most knowledgeable reporters on education in the U.S. and particularly in New York City. Um, and uh, Lonell Hancock, and it is taught in the form of a 15-week class that uh, is offered in the spring. These classes are called seminar and production classes. They're called that because you have the seminar, your lecture with um, the Professor Hancock and with various uh, uh, working journalists that she brings in. And then you have the production side of things. And so there's a wonderful website there that uh, students contribute to and can, can contribute multimedia stories as well. She embeds these students in New York City schools so that they can get a really up close view of um, how the biggest school district in the nation works and doesn't work in, in, in certain areas. And, um, and they do some really compelling um, stories. They often break news as well because of the access that they have. So, you know, it's a wonderful thing, and I am a big proponent of having a specialization uh, like education reporting in your pocket when you meet these recruiters that we bring to school in the spring. Elena, let me just say that you can take that class even if you're doing the data journalism concentration. Yeah. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, my name is Azmi. I live and work in New York. Um, and so, since I'm working full time, I'm mainly interested in the part time program. And I'm wondering, in terms of the investigative track, and then not not doing a specialization in the part time program, what kind of the what you can take in the investigative track if you were to not do a specialization, and then also what like the week to week schedule looks like. Um, I talked to Taryn a few weeks ago, and she mentioned that. There's evening and week, weekend classes, but I'm just kind of wondering what the... So we, we always have part-time students in our investigative reporting program. They take it for two years. Our investigative, you take my investigative reporting seminar throughout the year, and that is from six to nine, somewhere in the middle of the week, usually. Um, then you, ha you do your master's project in the summer, and that's the only thing you have, so you, you can focus on ma your master's projects. Then you take other classes, and we have a lot of evening classes. We have a few weekend classes if you want to say do video. I think we have weekend video classes, but and your reporting class which starts in the summer is either the weekend or weeknight. So yes, the answer is yes. You can fit in um, investigative reporting specialization over the two years and you will have the option to have evening and weekend classes. You're generally just taking one class at a time in the part-time program. So maintaining a job is is doable. Um, it's a lot of work, um, but you know that pace generally works quite well for our students. Why don't you send me an email, and I will put you in touch with our students who did the part-time investigative program, so you'll have a better idea of what the workload is like. It is a bit more than the than the regular, the not non-specialized MS. You take you take one extra class throughout the year. Thanks so much. Sheila, could you also mention um, the opportunities that are available for students in the non-specialized MS? Um, if they have an interest in investigative journalism, the kinds of courses that are available. I, I like to think of the non-specialized MS as the maximum flexibility program. If you want to learn about data, audio, video, and not be hampered by having to be in one of the con concentrations, I would suggest you take the regular MS program regular MS program, you can also take investigative classes. In fact, we require all our MS and also all our MA students to take an investigative techniques class. The investigative techniques class for the MS students is a seven week class, for the MA students it's a 15 week class. So no one graduates from our program without having a basic grounding in investigative skills. It means no one, we give you no choice. Mm -hmm. If you want to have more investigative and data skills, then you can take investigative or data classes in the spring. These are 15 week seminar and production classes which require you to, to actually do a deep dive and produce works of investigative or data journalism depending on the classes that you enroll in. Yeah. 
So you can have a so, um, fairly good grounding in investigative and data skills, even if you're not in the investigative or data programs. Same thing with video. Um, whatever type of video you want to be in, you, uh, you can do video for television, you can do video for the web, you can do video animation. We have a full range of courses that are available to you in whatever program, or audio for that matter. We have audio for public radio, we have audio for podcasting. So we have a whole range of classes. We have about 40 something different classes we offer in the spring. It's an embarrassment of riches. If you want to do book writing, you can do that too. Um, if you want to combine book writing and video, you can do that. If you want to combine um, the journalism of ideas with data visualization, you can do that. So the, the, the non-specialized MS programs allow you maximum flexibility to design the program, whether you want to specialize, whether you want to not specialize, you, you can do that with a regular program. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Netta. Um, I have two questions actually for, about the non-specialized program um, for MS. Um, so first of all, I just wonder how many students approximately you accept every year. And secondly, I wondered um, when you say like no experience is necessarily required, what exactly that means? Because I imagine when you apply, you have to provide like previous writing samples or like show somehow that you have some experience. So I just wonder if you could speak to that. Yeah, so the, the no experience thing first. Yes, we literally mean even if you have no experience, we've had um, students coming here from other careers. So they've been lawyers, which means doctors, which means lawyers. They not, can't necessarily write in the journalistic <laughs> way. Um, doctors, we've had people working for nonprofits. We've had, I've had in my class, um, army <coughs> veterans. I've had former policemen, um, people who've done investigative work for companies or for governments. They've come to the class and without really published work. But we do require a writing sample and that writing sample can be anything. It can be an investigative report you did for your company or a research project that you did. Something that shows that you're able to do in-depth and critical work that requires, you know, that shows a little bit of critical thinking and ability to do research and analysis, that will, that will suffice. Many people also yeah. submit college essays right. if they are straight out of university, so. Right. Yeah. Okay. I, we'll touch on that um, a little bit more when we talk about admission requirements. Um, and we do have some suggestions for people who have not done journalism. There are things that you can do to help strengthen your application even just in the next three months to get yourself some journalism experience. What uh, was your other question? Oh, just how many students approximately? Oh, 200, we have 200 students um, for the MS program. We have about 50 students for our MA program. We, and part-time students, we have two sections, so about 30. About 30 students. Each class, our normal class size is between 12 and 15 students. So we have small classes. And we guarantee you line, line editing and really close, you work closely with your instructors. Thank you. Yeah. And if there are any people on the live stream interested in the doctoral program, we take four doctoral students a year. Good morning, my name is Veronica Mino. I come from South America. I started my career as a di digital and television journalist. Now I'm involved in the political arena. I'm, I really love politics. So I, I want to ask you, Professor, please, if you could tell me what makes a difference in an application, because as an international student, I want to make a difference and I want to uh, be able to tell everything that I'm been living in the application. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Well, um, thanks for your question. I think, um, you know, first of all, one wants to, um, you, you obviously have a strong interest in that area and that comes through. I actually find, I think this is perhaps true for all applicants, MS or MA, I put quite a lot of stock in the essays that people submit, the personal essays that people do. Uh, because um, you're, you're free to really write and explain something about who you are as well as to write with a degree of freedom that you may not. If you've been working for uh, a daily newspaper, you may be locked into writing in a certain format and your personality as a writer may not have as much free reign to come out. So you have an opportunity in your application to explain who you are and why you want to do what you do and what your passions are and what your interests are. Obviously, if you have, um, if you've been operating in a foreign language, 
if you provide translation uh, of your work or subtitles, if it's a video or um, 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 transcript or something, if it's audio, we, we need to be able to examine. We don't speak all languages. Um, and obviously also, um, uh, if you're a foreign student, uh, having um, a strong TOEFL score is important because you'll be writing in English. So those are uh, the kinds of things we look for, but passion, commitment, um, uh, and um, uh, you're telling us who you are. I mean, I, for example, remember reading an application um, a number of years ago, um, and usually people are very, you know, these applications are very serious, and they say, you know, like, I knew I wanted to be a journalist from the time I was four years old when I was on my father's knee and he was reading the newspaper. Very earnest and sweet. Um, but I remember reading an application that actually made me laugh out loud. So it was very funny. He was talking about an extremely eccentric employer that he had in his first journalism job. And he wrote it so well, I thought, I've got to get this student in my class. It turned out, luckily, all of his other qualifications were as strong as his essay. But the ability to actually, the idea that you could write well enough in your application that you could connect with that, the fact that I can remember the student came to the program over 10 years ago, that I remember that is unusual. And so to be able to, to feel confident enough to write as you, as you are and to tell us who you are and to put that into the way in which you express yourself is, I think, very important, rather than trying to figure out, well, what do they want to hear from me and what will please um, them? You know, you have a chance to be yourself uh, in the application. Hi, my name is Cecilia. I'm wondering if anyone can speak about um, the Global Migration Project, um, Sarah Stillman's program. Um, yeah. Yeah, so we have a class in the spring called Gender and Global Migration. It's a class that taught by Sarah Stillman at the New Yorker. Um, she, she teaches the class and then during the, um, during the, in the course of the class, the students start working on projects related to the issue of, of migration and women. They, um, we have funding for the students of this class to go wherever in the United States or elsewhere in the world. So we've sent students to Jordan, to Greece, um, to, to cover stories on migration. And we have the option to get some of those students to apply for postgraduate fellowships in which they will be continuing to work in the next six months on stories related to that issue. So our students' work have been published in The New Yorker, Slate, elsewhere, all, o all over in many, many different, uh, yeah. But it's a very specialized class. It combines both subject matter dive, you know, you learn about issues of migration, especially as it refers to gender, and at this also hone your, your writing and presentation skills. We've done photographs, we've done um, video, we've done multimedia with the students as well. So we have another question from one of our live streamers. Um, it has to do with the PhD program, and she would like to know if there's anyone that can talk a little bit about the scope of the PhD program and what students usually do and pursue. Thank you very much for that question. I'm actually going to ask um, for the person who has that question to send me an email. And Edwin, if you could just give them my email address, I think it'll be easier. Um, if, w if we deal directly with, with you. Yes. Hi, my name is Marcos. I'm from Ecuador, and I'm highly interested in documentary program. And my specific question is how this program is, uh, the, the, the approach of this program, and especially with new media, transmedia, and new ways of storytelling, or if this program is more like a traditional focus. Um, no, we're trying. This, this program is journalistic documentary. It's very different from like the kinds of documentaries that you will learn from like the, our, f our school of, or for our school of the arts, which also has a documentary program. So our emphasis is in telling stories that are in the public interest. And we are currently expanding the program to include last year we had after effects training. This year maybe, Susan, you can talk about the experimental experiments we're doing with that program, yeah. Uh, sure. So, I mean, one of the things that, um, I mean, again, one of the exciting things about 
what's happening in Columbia Journalism right now is we're always innovating um, with the class format. So last year I actually taught, um, I usually teach data visualization. In the spring I collaborated with another professor to do data visualization and refugee issues. Um, this spring we're hoping to do a collaboration with um, uh, the documentary seminar that will bring data analysis and visualization into that. Um, so looking at how um, how how data information and representation of those things can be better, um, not necessarily, well, better integrated and, and integrated more creatively into, um, into documentary work. And uh, my understanding is that the output from those, uh, that program is uh, in, the, in the spring semester is um, a, around a three to five minute video. Um, but I know that Professor Cross, who leads it, um, is, you know, she's an active documentary filmmaker herself and that she does work um, looking at the, the whole business of documentary films, so including things like legal and contracts and things like that. Yeah. So it's a very comprehensive approach to what it means to be a documentary, an independent documentary right. filmmaker. Right. So it, it, it combines both traditional and new ways of telling stories, including animation data. It, the program includes everything from subtomats, from conceptualizing <laughs> to getting funding, to producing, and then how you market your documentary later, yeah. And I would also mention for people who are interested in um, journalistic documentary storytelling that we have what we call Film Fridays. Um, it's about every other Friday. Um, we screen documentary films um, in this space right here. Um, there's always pizza available, but then there are always guest speakers, um, directors, the producers of the, the documentaries that we're screening um, with a panel that's moderated normally by one of our documentary faculty members. Um, so there's a tremendous interest in everything video and documentary here, and of course um, those Film Fridays are open to the public, so you're all welcome to join us for those. And you can find the information about them if you go to the website and just click on the events um, link on the left side, the upper, no, the upper right side of the page. Hi, my name is Kay, and I'm a undergrad in my junior year studying electrical engineering and uh, in information technology and web science. So I'm interested in um, pretty much master of science program, and I'm wondering, like, um, how in depth those programs will be? Because um, as like a STEM major, I understand that like it t it's a huge time commitment to like study STEM or specialize in something. And uh, another question I have is, um, so um, how is the data journalism different from the traditional STEM data analysis? And as you mentioned, that some students in a program ending up going to like traditional technology companies. So what do you think the journalism side of education taught them? Sure, um, so I just want to clarify that there's kind of, uh, you know, there's three programs. Basically there's the Master of Science program, there's the three semester data concentration, yeah. and then there's the dual degree. Um, <clears throat> so what I would say is that um, it depends a lot how the, um, how the sort of data science aspects of the data concentration differ from what you might get in, say, electrical engineering. It's going to depend. It's going to depend a lot on what your prior program was. Um, I think what I would I would characterize the data portion of that as kind of a taste of everything. Um, so whereas obviously in an undergraduate program you probably have to make some selections about you know, whether you're gonna take an algorithms class or not, you're gonna get a little bit of everything. And of course for somebody with um, a, a STEM background, I think you'll you'll uh, benefit from the opportunity to really kind of push those concepts further than people who are maybe a little newer to the program. Um, I'd say its distinction from the dual degree is is significant. Um, you are getting a computer, you're getting a graduate degree, you're getting a master's in computer science. And so, um, you know, there's a level of involvement there. You're actually taking courses at the engineering school, again, algorithms, machine learning. Um, Sometimes we have people who like to do specialties in computer vision or audio. Uh, natural language processing is a, is a huge strength of Columbia Engineering. 
Um, and so uh, in terms of uh, thinking between the two, what I would say is that the dual degree is um, really for folks who are interested in, you know, uh, thinking about what's happening now, but also like five to ten years from now, or might be possible five to ten years from now, um, at, with advances in technology. Um, and in terms of, you know, some of our students who have gone to more traditional technology roles, um, I mean, I think one thing that, that I've observed is that technology companies, interestingly, are increasingly hiring people with storytelling capacities. Um, I know that I get uh, contacted every year by data science companies because they're interested in people who can tell stories. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the, the writing, communication, and conceptualization skills that you get as part of the journalism program are, I think, a huge asset to anyone actually going in, into even a STEM field because, um, you know, as you're probably aware, today's technologies, you know, the cutting edge technologies, machine learning, natural language processing, these are all about communication. And so understanding um, how those things are constructed and how they work is a really valuable uh, skill to have. Can I ask a really quick second question? Sure. Um, so uh, my f I'm getting an internship in New York City um, this summer for uh, consulting, spe um, especially for cybersecurity consulting. So mm -hmm. like for consultants, they, uh, their work in the future would require heavy travel. So I'm wondering like, how um, does part-time class have several different sections that you can choose from? So even if you're missing one, you can go to another one to make up for the class. Does that make sense? What I would say for um, people who are interested in the part-time program is that you must be either a U.S. citizen or permanent resident of the United States. Um, and otherwise, if you are not and you, um, you must take one of the full-time programs, um, and that's per the federal visa, right, student visa regulations here. In terms of the core selection, um, in, in the part-time program, there are some um, opportunities to choose to take a class either on a Saturday, like the reporting class is offered on a Saturday from 10 to 4, and the, um, uh, a second section on Monday, Wednesday nights from 6 to 9. Um, However, I have found that students who tell me at the beginning that they have a job that has frequent travel, immediately a red flag goes up because as a journalism school, we're quite strict about attendance, you know, and um, being on time as well, just because those are in important skills to have as a journalist. And on top of which, you're investing a lot in this education. You don't want to miss a second of it. Um, so that uh, can be an issue, but it's not necessarily, you know, a deal breaker. It's something that you should come and talk to me about. Thank you so much. Hello, <clears throat> um, I'm interested in environmental reporting in, um, e on issues of energy justice and the intersection of, of politics and climate change. And I was wondering if you have um, a specific uh, cohort of students who are interested in similar issues or if there's coordination with other programs at, at Columbia um, that uh, are focused on those topics. Yeah, I mean, there are, we have faculty who have very strong interests in those subjects. Marguerite Holloway teaches both in the MA and in the MS program, who does a lot of, uh, has done a lot of environmental reporting. She teaches um, uh, one of the two sections in the MA program uh, where you could certainly do a great deal um, in that area, and I would recommend it very, very highly because, again, it comes with um, a very high-powered training in the science um, involved in that as well as working on your uh, journalism. Within the MS, um, in recent years, she's been um, doing um, a, a hybrid course together with another faculty member, Du Lin Tu, who's a video journalist, and they've been doing environmental reporting in video. I had to give you an, I an idea. but. Um, so there's a lot you can do um, depending on your background. Um, uh, the, the MA might be, if you already have this developed interest, might be um, the route to go because you can really um, drill down and do a lot in that specific area if you choose to. Mm -hmm. I would also suggest you get in touch with Marguerite Holloway who runs our science programs here at the yeah, school. she's around. You can also have a uh, talk with me at the end as well. Hi, my name is Christine, and um, I also want to ask about the writing samples. 
Um, so I've been working as a copy editor for about five years now, and I was wondering um, if, um, just because in, the, in my, most, my most recent work is all having been editing samples instead of writing samples, and I guess I was wondering if um, that is one accepted, and also um, if it would be less preferred than, in, say, like an older sample that I actually did do um, all of the writing in. I think the older sample that's written, it's really hard with <coughs> copy edited stuff to know, I mean, something could be a brilliant piece of writing and we'd have no way of knowing whether it came in in great shape and um, what your role in it is. I think we want a piece that you originated because we also want to know how you think as well as how you write. Um, your copy editing skills will put you in good shape. You'll probably give us cleaner and better copy than many of your classmates, but in terms of evaluating you as a potential journalist, we want to see something you've written. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you all very much for those great questions. This was wonderful. And I'm going to say thank you also to our faculty members. It's been wonderful having you here, um, and we'll release you now to this beautiful day. Thank um, you. And for those of you in the audience and on the live stream, we will continue with our student panel. Right. I think my students are sitting in the back there, and I'll invite you all to come on up. I'm going to turn things over now to Taryn Almanzar, our Director of Financial Aid and Admissions. And actually, I'd like to take just a quick moment to introduce some other staff members who are here in the audience right now. Um, first of all, David Hooker, who is our office manager, keeps us all going in the right direction, and who many of you know already from having corresponded with him. Um, Gina Bubion who is standing in the back, the Associate Director of the Career Services Office, and who will be speaking very shortly with you. And then Edwin Isaac, who is sitting in the back, our Assistant Director of Financial Aid and Admissions, um, and who is handling the live stream chat for us this morning. Hello and welcome once again. Um, so now we're going to have our student panel. If you could introduce yourselves, just say um, briefly what you were doing before the J School and what led you to apply here, and then we'll take it from there. Okay. I'll go first. Uh, hi, my name is Davi Hernandez. I am currently in the documentary specialization, so I heard a few of you are interested in that. Uh, I actually had no journalism background before coming here. I was a forensic psychologist. I was working with victims of human trafficking. And I was really frustrated with the kind of uh, trauma coverage that I was seeing. Um, and I decided to jump over and help fix that. Great. Good morning. Um, I'm Lauren Cook. I am in the part-time program. And I work full-time for CNN. I've been working for CNN for over a year now, so I was already there when I applied to this program. And really, I wanted to apply because I wanted to better myself in my writing, and I really just saw a need for you know, my future and coming here. So that's why I chose to come, and I've not regretted it since. Hi, uh, my name is Trigve, and I'm, uh, I'm from Iceland. And, ha and before I came here, I'd been working for the National Broadcaster in Iceland for uh, five years, five and a half years. Um, and doing uh, 
both breaking news and, and uh, some investigative stuff. And I really wanted to get more in depth. I'm in the science concentration, by the way, of the of the MA program. And uh, you know, I'd always loved science, and but I did really did want to go into like investigative reporting in uh, terms of like related to the environment and uh, things like that. So yeah, that, that's that's uh, why I came here. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Now, if you can tell us um, what your experience has been like um, through the program, very briefly as well, because we want to open it up for questions. And if you want, and if it has turned out to be what you had expected. Um, I'm so sorry, Terry, could you explain the first yes. question? If you can explain what your experience has been like, oh, perfect. and if it's, um, if it, wa if it is what you were expecting. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it actually wasn't what I expected. Um, I found that I expected the faculty to be more of a um, faculty-student relationship, but what I've actually found is that it's more of colleagues talking, and so I feel extremely comfortable with all my faculty going and asking them any questions I have. Um, if I'm on a shoot, even for CNN, and I have a law question, I would call up Tammy Luby, who is one of my professors, and say, hey, what do I do? And they're so helpful. So I really didn't expect that going in, but I've been really pleasantly surprised about how that's turned out. Um, the part-time program is very rigorous for those who are um, thinking of going into it, but it's doable. Like I said, the faculty are really, really accepting of anyone with full-time jobs, because really, that's why we're here, to have a full-time job in news. So. I think that's what I expected and how I'm doing so far. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, uh, I've, I've, yeah, it's, it's been, um, it's actually been uh, surprising in a way that, because um, the MA program is, uh, you know, by definition, a little less hands-on because it's, uh, you're going in depth into a specific field uh, and it's a little more academic, but I think it's like beautifully structured in a way that you're doing a lot of hands-on uh, work at the same time. And uh, it's it's uh, yeah, there's there's more hands-on than uh, in there than I was uh, expecting. But you're also at the same time going like very deep into like in the science. We're we're meeting with uh, we're meeting with uh, top scientists in their fields. We have a lot of guest professors come in. And we're doing a lot of reading, and 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 it's it's uh, yeah, it's working really well. Run! I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, I I like Lauren. It was not what I expected. Like I thought, I heard that it was gonna be really intense, and um, I heard that it was gonna be great, and I thought I knew what it was gonna be, and then I was actually in it, and it's like this is amazing. Like. You're going to work, you will work very, very hard, but it's going to be so much more rewarding. Like every time my reporting class in particular, we have a story due every week and every Friday I'm freaking out and I submit the story and then it's like, oh my God, I did that. Um, and for those of you who maybe have some sort of background in journalism, you will learn so much. Um, I thought that it was just because I didn't have any background, I was going to get a lot out of it. Um, half of my reporting class had some sort of journalism background, and they are so much better already. And we've only been in this for like two months. Okay, great. Now, I'm going to open it up for question in a little bit, but before we do that, about a year ago, you were sitting in that chair. So if you can think back to that year, what advice would you give those who are thinking of applying or are going through the application process? Can you start? I actually have a story. Okay. Um, Taryn, you probably don't remember this, but we met um, when I was at my orientation a year ago, and you gave me the, the advice to go get coffee with Elena Cabral, who is the director of the part-time program. And I was nervous, but I reached out, as you suggested, and I got coffee with Elena, and that's what solidified that I wanted to apply. So I suggest for all of you to really, if you have a director in mind or a faculty in mind, reach out to them, ask them if they want to get coffee really fast, buy them a coffee, ask them any questions you have, um, because it really could solidify your decision whether this is right for you or not. Um, something kind of similar. Um, I, when I was in the process of applying, I applied to CUNY and I applied to Columbia, and I took classes in both. Uh, and I think that really, really solidified my decision to come here. CUNY works for some people, and 
but like I knew the moment I was here that this was the place I needed to be in. And definitely to follow up on Lauren, um, take advantage of the opportunities. You can actually come and audit classes. I didn't know that. There's been like three people, three people in my classes already and I wish I would have done that because the faculty is amazing here. And I think if I would have known coming in the professors that I wanted to take and I would have already made that connection, I wouldn't be struggling so much right now to pick the classes that I want because everything here is like amazing. I would say from my experience that it, you should really look, look closely at the curriculum of, of the program that you're thinking about. Uh, I was actually, well, before I learned that much about how the different programs were structured, I was like on the verge of should I apply for the MS or should I apply for the MA? So really do look into it, talk to the people at the admissions office like I did. Uh, I also met with uh, Marguerite Holloway, our uh, science, uh, the director of the science program, MA program. And, um, and I, I was thinking about politics as well for, uh, for a moment. So I also met with Alexander Stille, who was here before. And, uh, you know, Marguerite sent me the syllabus and I looked and you look at the details to see what suits you and, and what you want to do. So with that, I know that you must have questions, so if you can approach the microphone and ask our students the, um, any questions that you may have. No? Hi. <coughs> um, regarding the MA uh, thesis project, how much of like a pre-bake do you feel like you had to do before you started the program? Like, had, was it still in the conceptual stage? Have you done like preliminary interviews? Or you're still like, I have no idea? <laughs> Right, so uh, I was actually, uh, I'll say a little bit stressed out about that uh, over the summer. I was like, you know, I don't have an idea yet. And today I have not settled on a topic, <laughs> to, be, to be frank. Uh, I have a couple of ideas and, and, and you don't have to submit your formal proposal until November, uh, but you get assigned uh, a thesis, ad thesis advisor um, and uh, you meet with them and you develop your ideas into something that, that's uh, more of a developed proposal. But some people come in with a, with a pretty uh, robust idea when they, at, you know, at the st right at the start. But don't worry about that. <laughs> Do you want to answer also that question, I think, for those who are interested in the MS program to see what your thesis uh, process is like? So our thesis for part-time starts in the summer of our second year. So I will begin in May my project, um, my master's thesis. And you pretty much go into the program, you know, having an idea of maybe what you would like to even concentrate in. So some people want to do documentaries. So they focus more on video work. For me, I want to go into more crisis and war reporting. So I'll look at subjects related to maybe refugee crisis or um, something politically related internationally, but uh, mine will be writing based because I am in mostly writing classes and I have not picked a topic yet <laughs> or even thought about it. Um, I would say come with an open mind uh, because a lot of times you run, especially I've heard this happens a lot in reporting, you like cover a story and then you're like, wait, there's more here. And so you wanna keep digging in there's a few of my classmates that, I'm in a documentary program, so it's a little bit different, but there's a few of my classmates in the regular MS that are considering maybe like developing more from what they've already reported on for reporting. Um, for the documentary program, um, we work on a proposal, but it's also kind of different because we're in pairs. Uh, and so my partner has to submit her pitch, I have to submit my pitch. And right now we're just like, looking into topics like I kind of have an idea what I want to do um, but I would say have an open mind because you might find like a gold mine that you want to like, like dig in. Hi my name is Chris Howell and uh, this is probably mostly for Lauren. I also work in broadcast and I'm interested in the MS part-time program and I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about how uh, I assume you've probably had some pretty wacky work schedules <laughs> at CNN and how that works with your class schedule and your pro your weekly uh, projects. Sure. Um, so for the part-time program, my summer reporting class was Tuesday, Thursdays from 6 to 9, and then it was also Sundays from 11 to 2 for the first month. 
to the summer was probably the most difficult, I'd say, so far, because, um, you know, breaking news, you really can't get away from class. But what I found, especially recently, um, this past Monday, as we know, we had the Las Vegas massacre, and I had class from 6 to 9 on Monday, and I immediately emailed my professor and was in touch with him all day, saying, look, I'm so sorry. I work in our news department, and I am really unable to get away for this class. And while attendance is mandatory, they do make exceptions if you, you know, work in breaking news or if something is an emergency and comes up. So it's very difficult to balance both. You kind of have to say, yeah, I'm going to work from 7.30 to 3.30 today and then go home, take a quick nap, and spend the next six hours writing this paper that I have to do and reporting. Um, but you do make it work. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to flip that question to those of you that are doing the program full time. Can you talk a little bit about how you structure your day and um, how time management works and all of that? I still ask myself that every day. Um, it is, uh, I heard this so many times before coming to the full-time program that you can't work, you can't work. And before I started, I was like, I'll wait the first month and I'll see if I get a little something on the side. You can't. Like, you really, really, really can't. Um, you will get as much out of the program as you put into it, and that requires a lot of time. It requires a lot of talking to different faculty, people that, like, you only get to pick, like, three classes the whole year. So if you really want to make connections with faculty, you have to make an effort like outside of your reporting time. Um, also, reporting in particular takes a lot of time. Um, I'm out reporting about an hour and a half away from here, four or five days a week. Um, and that pays off in my stories. It really, really does. And so I think um, be willing to make a lot of sacrifices is the most that I will say. Um, but also learn to say, I need a break today, um, and be okay with that. Um, last weekend, that was it for me. I was like, I, I need a break today, and I'm just going to take it, and I'm going to enjoy it because I need this. And so I read a book, and it was great. And then now I'm recharged, and I can go back to reporting and back to giving it all that I've got. But yeah, definitely be realistic with your time. Uh, don't take on 20 million things. Don't try to get a job. If it works for you, great. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, <coughs> I would say that, um, um, well, time management is, is uh, uh, something that I'm still developing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, but because it's, it's a lot of, the, you have to juggle, juggle a lot of, of things and you have to prioritize. You have to like pick what you do want to do and what you don't want to do because there's so much to do here. There's so much, I mean, we have a lot of required reading, but there's also so much that uh, our professors are suggesting as, as uh, recommended extra readings, as uh, there's a lot of lectures that you can, can go into here. There's skills classes, there's workshops. So you really do want to dive into it and, and uh, do a f like be fully committed. Um, so it, it's really up to you how much you want to put into it and uh, if you really want to, uh, you know, be con consumed by the program in a, in a, good, in a good sense, then th it's, it's, it's great. But you do have to, have to uh, s you, know, you know, have your schedule in order and, 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 and uh, you know, yeah, your calendar has to be up to date every day. <laughs> Um, so my question is directed to Davi. I wanted to ask about the documentary program. Uh, my question was, do you do more writing, reporting, or is it more of a geography? Because I'm assuming it should be more, more filming aspect, but I'm pretty sure there's also writing. So I just wanted to know what the balance of both of them is like. So I would say my experience so far is your reporting actually comes from your reporting class. That's where you're going to learn to report and like get to the bottom of like what you're trying to look at. My reporting professor is amazing and he really, really, really pushes us. Um, and so now that we're starting to talk about researching and reporting a documentary, I'm not so afraid because I know what to look for a little better. Um, 
it is different. So the documentary class is going to focus a little more on the technical side of things. Um, they mentioned earlier, it is very storytelling focused, not so much cinematic. So you do learn some skills, but the core of your project is going to be your reporting on it. Um, there's definitely talks. So we've had uh, Nina Berman, who's an amazing photographer. She's coming to class a few times and talked to us about her reporting process. She's also an amazing reporter. Um, but I would say get as much as you can out of your, out of your reporting classes um, because that's going to supplement. I don't think documentaries like so focused on reporting that you're going to feel like you're fine there. Because I think that is why the program is built this way, and that's why you get like reporting first, and reporting is the foundation for everything else that you do the rest of your year here, even in doc. So you usually report something, write about it, and then and then create the documentary. Is that how it works? Uh, no. So report your reporting mo uh, reporting module is different and it's separate from doc. Um, you just learn the skills to report, mm -hmm. and so you learn how to find a story. A lot, of, a lot of the program is about finding stories. And that's also very depending on your reporting professor. They all have different methods. My reporting professor is very much like, spend like every waking second that you have in your reporting beat and find stories. And that's paid off. I had an idea of what I wanted to do with my documentary. So I now know how to find the stories that I'm looking for because I knew my topic and didn't know the stories. Um, and then, the thing with documentaries is that you have, you're paired up with someone, and so that other person is also pitching on something. So what I would recommend if, is if you know early on someone that you want to work with in your documentary, start working on it together, start doing the reporting together. So one, when one of the pitches is like the plan B, you're still very invested in it, but also because you get to like really dive deep into it. Um, I think, We've only been in this program for like two months, and so we're still learning a lot of like the technical skills. We're still learning uh, the how to like film and work with the camera and like audio mix and all these things. Um, so we're just getting into the like the part of like really looking for the story. Um, so I think I think it depends a lot on your reporting professor, and um, I'm also not there yet. Thank you. Simran from India, who is uh, on the live stream, is asking the MA panelist, how rigorous is the coursework, and does the program have the flexibility to take classes from other programs, not necessarily related to your concentration? Right. Uh, you do take, uh, the, it's, it's uh, I mean, the, the, it's, uh, it, it's a big part of the program is actually taking outside classes, but they do have to be related to your concentration. Um, I, for instance, I'm taking a, a class at the astronomy department now. It's called the Science of Space Exploration, and so you do ha you do get to uh, meet uh, professors at other departments and other schools here, uh, and and uh, you know learn from them, and also you know get to know the community and and, and what people who are you know in the within the field that you're interested in. Uh, how they think, uh, what the cutting at science is like in that field, or and, and you know, speaking for like my friends who are, for example, in the, in the politics concentration, they're taking a lot of them are taking, uh, I think, classes at at CIPA, the School of International and Public Affairs, about Russian politics and etc. 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 So you do you do get a lot of um, a lot of uh, exposure to to the wider Colombia community. My name is Kay, um, and I'm wondering for um, a Master of Science program, um, let me put it in a better way, um, how would you see yourself preparing for the school if you still have one more year before you apply? Does that make sense? Like, for example, I'm still an undergrad, and like, how would you utilize this one year or two to prepare yourself better for the journalism school? application if you had a second chance. 
I mean, you guys all got in, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, so that's, there's two parts to your question. I think one of them is for the application and another is for like once you're in, uh, because they're actually two very different things from what I found. So I think when you're in the process, I would say really make sure that this is the place that you wanna go. Um, Columbia has a great name and it's a great school. Um, but also make sure that you're looking into the faculty, you're looking into the specializations, you're looking into the kind of curriculum that they have and that they offer, and make sure that this is the place you want to commit to. Um, I would say if you don't have any journalism experience and you have the opportunity to take some sort of journalism minor in your school, do that. I, I extended my graduation in undergrad another two semesters just so that I could do a minor. Um, and I, I think it helped me. And my professor from undergrad actually graduated from this school too. So I, I actually see a lot of what she taught here as well. Um, I think once you apply and you get in, and I heard this a lot, um, become like devoted to journalism and like really, re really read journalism and not just for that, oh, let me see what this story is saying. Like, look at it, learn the craft, like look, like, look at the way people are writing. Um, and I think, I, I thought I had done enough of that, but once you're in the program, there's so much coming at you that there's times where like, I find myself not being able to read any notes during that day at all, and I suffer, like I, I feel it. Because it, it does enable you to, once you're in class and your professor tells you, don't do this, do that, you're like, that's why people do that. And like, it starts making sense to you. Um, I think everyone's background is different, and like I said, like I didn't have any like journalism background. I did like a tiny minor, um, but don't be discouraged by your background. Like just if if you see the way you can bring what you've learned into journalism, and you're very passionate about that, they will see that here and it will really pay off. And also, um, I, going off of what Davi said, read the news seriously. Um, Pick up the New York Times on your way to work or school every morning and actually read it. Sign up for the skim. The skim is seriously my That's best right. friend. I read it every morning. Um, look at the AP. The AP has five things you need to know for your day, um, and it gives you the top five stories. Look at CNN's website. I still do that for my own story ideas at CNN for digital video. Um, just scour. Look, because when you get here, they're going to ask you what's going on in the world, and they will give you news quizzes. and. You're gonna wanna know what's up to date and what you actually want to do. And once you're here too, like, it's not just like, oh, I need to read the news. You're like, you want to read the news because I think one thing they do really well here is like, you don't see journalism as a job. Like, you grow so passionate for it. And, and it gives you that desire of like, I want to read the news. You don't have to, you want to. Uh, yeah, if I may add for the, from a pers MA perspective, that uh, for those who are interested in the MA program, because, uh, you know, the, the definition is that you want to dive into a, a specific field, but it's also, you're also learning a lot, even though, I mean, some reporting experience is assumed when you come in, so uh, professors are not going into the nuts and bolts of, of reporting per se, but we're doing a lot of in-depth uh, analysis of writing and, and developing our writing skills. So really do look at, uh, as Debbie said, uh, you know, how do people write? Uh, structure do like read long form stories we're doing a lot of like long form like read the new yorker the new york times and and all those those the, that in-depth reporting and really look at it thank you very much hi there my name is megan um and my question to you is how much of the work that you've done so far has been individually based and how much has been kind of in groups or with peer editing and kind of how are you working with your classmates on your projects? Um, for the part-time or full-time program, are you wondering? Uh, for both, both? I'd love to hear from all uh, of you. For the part-time, in you start in the summer, so you start at the end of May and you work in partners for your first about four weeks um, for just stories that you're pushing out for your reporting professor, but after that it becomes all individual based. We had two big papers due for our reporting class in the summer um, that you pick a beat on something related to social justice and you turn out two papers related to that. And now that I'm in 
you know, a different class outside of the reporting class, now that it's fall, it's all individual based. So for the part-time program so far, what I've seen is that it's mostly individual with a little bit of partner work, but um, it's mostly individual work for me. You good? Um, I'll probably be saying this a lot throughout the day. Um, I think a lot depends on your reporting professor. Um, they all have different ways. Uh, my reporting professor would do everything individually. Um, I think there's like two or three of my friends who are in different reporting classes. And one of the classes, for example, is set up so it runs like a newspaper and they run like an online publication. And so you have like, they rotate so like one week, like two people run the social media, two people run like, the, they're like copy editors and so on. Um, and so they'll like be working like in little pairs. Um, then there's another class where like two people can every once in a while like work on a story together. And so it really depends. Um, and I think a lot of your experience will depend on your reporting professor. Um, yeah. Yeah, for the MA, it's it's uh, it's all individual. Uh, I mean, we're working together a lot, and and, and, and but it's a, it's a really, you know, collaborative environment. But all your assignments and all your projects are individual. That that said, uh, with the outside classes, uh, not mine, but probably many of the some of the outside classes, at least they probably will have will have group group assignments. But um, also something. Something with the with the outside classes. Some professors uh, at the school, not all of them, not 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 all of them, but uh, some, for instance, mine with the uh, my astronomy class. He was he was willing to tailor the class towards me being a journalist. So I'm not doing like the quantitative, all the you know equations and all the uh, problems that that the uh, that the guys who are like really want to be you know, astronomers or physicists or whatever are doing. Uh, but instead, he, he allows me to do journalistic uh, writing. And uh, that's done in, in uh, uh, yeah, it is like a co-work of, of, of him and me and my science professor here. And we do, so there are, there's a lot of options, yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Clarissa. Um, for the MA program, do you think it's possible to keep um, a job while you're working it, not necessarily full-time where you have to go into an office, but more freelance full-time where you can kind of work wherever? I, I would not recommend it at all. Uh, I mean, I'd, it might be physically possible, but I don't think it's, it's uh, vi wise because you really do want to spend all of your time on, on this because it's just such a great experience. There's just so much that you that you want to do once you come into the program that you realize that you're not gonna be able to do it all. So I would adv advise against it, but, but uh, you know, it's, it's, it might be possible. Yes, it's definitely not the norm. Um, as they've all said, you want to make the most out of the program and it's not just your time inside of the classes, but there are workshops as they've mentioned, there's guest speakers, there are other classes, skills classes that you want to take. So if you're making the investment of um, taking the time to be here, then you really want to make the most of your time here. So. Okay, thank you. Hi, this is a question for Davi and Lauren. Um, I was just wondering if you guys did any kind of prep for the writing test and if you had any tips on it. I mean, I'm not expecting you guys to give out answers or anything. But <laughs> I, I did the thing that probably everyone did, which is you go online and you say, what's going to be on the writing test at Columbia? And they say, memorize all the countries in the Middle East, know every single Supreme Court justice, all this stuff. None of that was on my writing <laughs> test. Um, it's mostly short essay, short, short essay based. Um, and so they could ask you, if you were in the room with this person, give me five questions that you'd ask them as a journalist right now. Um, so things like that. I would just say, you know, know your current events and be prepared. Just practice writing a couple things about everyone that's in the news recently, but um, be prepared to not know, I guess. What was yours like? <laughs> if I could just make one comment about the test. Yeah. The test that you find online when you look it up is from 2003. <laughs> We're now in 2017. And I think as you heard from the faculty, we adjust things constantly here at the journalism school, so just ignore that test. <laughs> <laughs> Work on your writing. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
I did something similar. I was also applying to CUNY, so I was like, oh, it's probably gonna be like the same format. Um, it was not at all. Uh, yeah, so similar experience. Mine was three questions. Um, what I will say the test does is it measures both how much you know of current events and how critically, like how you can think critically. Because that question that she's talking about, it dealt exactly with that. It was something along the lines of, if you could be in a room with this person and you could ask them five questions, what would they be? And keep in mind, this person is interviewed by the media all the time. And the five people that were on the list, if you did not know current events, you would not know who they were, except for Ivanka Trump. Um, <laughs> everyone else was people that like were diplomats or presidents or something was happening. Um, and that question was trying to get you at, one, do you know who they are? Do you know why they're in the news? Aside from being the president of the Philippines, why is, is Duterte on the list? And it was because of the massacres that were happening in the Philippines. Um, and then because everyone's asking probably the same questions of like, oh, how does it feel to be president or something like, what, like, what can you ask that no one else is asking? And so I think, I think write what, like practice your writing because you also cannot have a spell check on. So make sure you, you know, like you know how to spell. Um, but also it's just really trying to get you, like they're trying to see how you think. Um, and that's, to me, I think that's something that I don't know that you can practice mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. uh, if I may add from the MX perspective again, we, uh, we don't have to take the red, have to take a writing test, but we do have to uh, submit samples. And uh, just since I'm international, just for those who are coming from abroad, and uh, so I just wanted to say that, that uh, you know, they do, they do get a pretty good picture of your writing abilities from your essays that you have to submit. There's like three of them, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, but in terms of your uh, uh, writing samples, or in my case, um, they were all broadcast. So what I did, I, I went on YouTube and ju I just picked, I picked three stories that I'd done on for TV and I uploaded it to YouTube and subtitled them. And it's like there's a subtitling tool, so don't don't worry about you can you can submit something like if it's video in another language, just subtitle it's fine. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> yes. Thank, Thank you. Tip. Thank you. Hi, thanks for sharing your experiences. Uh, my name is Dominic Reuter. I'm more interested in the Master of Arts program, but my question has to do with sort of for all of you um, and your classmates' experience about lifestyle. Um, where do you guys live? Uh, near campus, far from campus, and um, what impact do you think that has on your experience and from your friends? Yes, yeah, so uh, the, there's a, there is uh, housing for graduate students, but it's uh, the journalism school has a really simple rule: is that you know, uh, in terms of determining who gets housing, because it's, it's limited, so it's uh, mostly internet. It's it's determined on how far away you live. You live from New York, actually. So. Um, you know, it, most of the people who do get uh, housing are, are uh, international students, but some, at least this year, at some U.S. students did too. But I find that uh, most of the students, uh, not all of them, but ma very many of them, they live really close, and uh, and uh, that's that's a really. I mean, I think that's really good because you do have to. There's a lot. There's so much that you have to. You do of time management, you have to juggle things, and, and if you do wanna like, uh, be a part of the community and meet with your peers, et cetera, you, you do wanna be close to campus and, and be able to come here and, and meet up with them for lunch and do a quick, you know, for drinks, just you know, an hour or two, and, and then you go back and, and do something else. And so I would recommend staying close to campus, yeah. Absolutely. We usually recommend for students to live no further than 45 minutes away from the school because as they said, there's so many things going on and you want to do your reporting and your editing and you want to be close to, to the school. <laughs> yes, I'll repeat what Christine just said, which is true um, for those who are watching us via live stream. She said you can't always depend on the transportation and that's true. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Caroline. Um, I think this question probably pertains to all the programs, but specifically to the full year 
or full-time MS. Um, a recurring theme is kind of like it goes so fast, really look into your choices, make sure you're selecting the right courses and professors. I'd love to hear your experiences um, sort of doing the background research for which classes you want to enroll in and then also getting into those courses. Is there a lot of bottlenecking and people all racing for the same course? Um, and yeah, I'd just love to hear how that works. Um, so for the, I'll speak specifically to the fall semester. Um, for the fall semester, you pick one class, uh, one writing class. And that is usually, as long as you submit it within a certain time frame, if, you, if it's your first choice and there's no scheduling conflicts, you'll likely to get in the class. And then there's like a drop where it's like a wait list. Um, I thought I had done enough of researching before coming here. And I now I realize I didn't do enough. Um, well, Lauren said it's a great point. Like, reach out to your, like, reach out to the people you're considering, like, and, like, taking their classes and ask for coffee or ask to come to their office hours. I found that the faculty here is very, very approachable and they like they love talking to students. Um, I'll give an example, like Del Maharaj is, I'm like obsessed with the guy now. Like every time I read something that he writes, I'm like, why didn't I take your class? Um, and he was my fourth choice. Um, and there's no scheduling conflicts and I don't get to take him. Um, so I would say really research it um, beforehand talk to them um, because I think there's also something to be said about the teaching method of each professor um, that we all have like different learning styles and like I like people that are like very hands-on and like very much like go do do um, and you want to know those things beforehand and they're very very approachable really um, so don't be afraid to like look at the curriculum and be like, oh, I'm really interested in this class. If you click on it, um, or if you click through the faculty, it would actually tell you the classes that they teach. And then if there's something you're interested in, like reach out to them and be like, hey, I'm considering this. And most likely they're, they're gonna meet with you. Yeah, I agree completely. The part-time program's a little different. Um, we have our professors pick our classes, our director. Um, we pretty much submit the classes that we want to take to them and then they create the schedules that work kind of best for everyone. So um, going off Dobby, just look at the list and really look at the classes that you want to take. If you're considering going into you know, education, then look at the classes that are mostly related to that that you'd really think would be cool to take. Um, take everything you can that you can. In the MA, the, uh, uh, all of the course, courses that you take at the journalism school, they're, they're required courses but then there are the outside courses. You take like one in the fall and two in the spring, and uh, you do really wanna shop around. And you have you, you get like a week, uh, the first week is like all about going to different classes, and I do really recommend uh, that people really go and, and talk to the professors, go up to them after the class, and, and, and uh, even schedule office hours, like really look into what you wanna take. Because, uh, but 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 they're really m most of them are really approachable. So so just yeah, talk the, to the professors. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yes. And with that, we're going to wrap this student panel. Thank you so much for taking the time to come here and share your experiences, and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. So, with that said, I'm going to welcome my colleague Gina Bouillon, who will be talking about career services. One second, one second. Okay. 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 
Can you hear me in the back? I will go as fast as possible because I know we're running behind schedule. So uh, I'm part of the career development team here that guides students from day one to graduation day and beyond. We do a lot of one-on-one -on -one counseling. We bring in dozens and dozens of employers, newspapers, digital only platforms, broadcast platforms and editors and producers to talk to you all year long. We run career workshops for students on how to write cover letters and resumes. So by the time the end of the year comes, you're, you're either you know, you're, you're employed or, or you're, you know what to do. We also run a huge job fair in the spring. It's the biggest career, purely journalism career expo in the country. And we, it, it, this coming year, it's happening in March. And uh, we expect about 150 companies. That's, it's all journalism. And um, it's, a big, it's a big event in the life of the school. But first, I want to just give a reality check. Uh, there's no guarantee of a job after graduation. We don't know what companies will bite the dust between now and May. We don't know which companies will rise from the ashes and reinvent themselves. We don't know what kinds of jobs will exist. You know, new job t titles are, are constantly being developed. So, but we, what we do know is that the program does prepare students for uh, for journalism jobs and 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 all kinds of, of of jobs in the new in the new digital environment. So I'm going to share with you some statistics from employment statistics from the class of 2017 that just graduated. So you get an idea of what our students do, but also what the industry is doing in general. So uh, as of graduation, within like a week or two of graduation, 73% of our students had something lined up either a job or an internship or, or they were continuing on in another degree program. Now, as you shop around and look at other journalism programs, I, I really be beseech you to, to interrogate their figures because um, this 73% is as of graduation. Other schools at Columbia take their measure and collect their data at a completely different point in the year. The law school, for instance, 11 months after graduation, the business school, three months after graduation, and our competitors in journalism also uh, have their different time points. So as you look around, please be a reporter and ask when they have, when, when the data is, is collected and how many people are in the sample. So a lot of schools don't have 100% reporting for one re reason or another. We do because we do it so close to graduation. Everybody's here. Um, we actually don't give out graduation tickets for your family unless you fill out a form that tells us what you're doing, and that's why we have 100% <laughs> um, participation. So now I'm going to show you some really interesting um, graphics on, on the journalism world. So this, is, this shows you, it's a little fuzzy from the back, but you can probably see. This is showing you what, um, where students ended up as far as the, the platform. So the red line at the top, that's, that is um, it, about a 30, 33% share of students who went into digital only platforms. And then the purple line right be below that is, you'll see that it spiked up this last year. That's broadcast related, um, bro students who went into broadcast uh, outlets and their online operations. And then the, the line below that is the newspaper line and the, when I say newspapers, and the, and the online uh, pr platform. And then at the bottom there is, is uh, magazine and wire services, which has sort of been on the decline for quite a while. So this is, you know, this is going back to 2010, and the, you know, the exact percentages aren't, aren't particularly important, but you can see the trend line here of digital being sort of ascendant for a long time, and now suddenly broadcast having a bit of a, you know, pivot to video, which you probably have heard about. Uh, whether this is a trend, we'll have to wait to see what happens this year and the year after, because as you can see, the broadcast and the newspaper lines have been crisscrossing each other for the last seven years. So what's interesting is, now this is looking not as great on, <laughs> on the big screen as it is on my computer in my office. However, I hope you can make this out. Um, what this is showing you, th the question we ask students when, we, um, when they're graduating is, what's the main job duty that you were hired for? And what's surprising is, regardless of the platform where they're going, the main job duty is, is print reporting, reporting and, and writing. 
Um, and close after that is, is video related, video and audio related and on air. If, if you added video, audio, and on air reporting jobs, it's sort of, it's in the 70, low 70% and that's sort of, you know, um, I mean, 70 people, so it's, it's sort of approaching the text reporting. So I want everybody to understand that regardless of what you end up uh, specializing in in terms of um, you know, your platform, you, you, it's the most likely outcome is you're going to be a reporter at the end. Um, and then you know, other, other fields here as well. Okay, so you have in your packet a list of all the companies that hired somebody from the class of 2017. And you also have a list of companies that attended the Career Expo. Uh, what I would like to just point out is that the, the, the J School brand is such that certain companies hire a lot of people every year. And that's just the power of, of the Columbia <coughs> brand, the quality of the education, the quality of the students, and, and the, the quality of the teaching. So. Th this was such that, uh, you know, CNN and their different um, branches hired 11 people from the last, last year's class in, in Atlanta, where they're headquartered, and in New York. Um, so going down the line, you see, you know, CBS, ABC News hire multiples of our students. Every year, this, 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 this uh, slide changes around, and it's kind of fun to see who's going to, you know, what companies are going to emerge as the big hi hirers of our students. So. As you do your research on where you want to go to go to grad school, there's a really valuable tool called LinkedIn where you can go to, you, there's a Columbia Journalism School LinkedIn page and you ought to be able to search it and I do recommend that you do that. And what you're looking for is, you know, na name the, the, your dream, your, your pie in the sky companies where you would like to work and then, you know, search and see how many Columbia grads are at that place. And so I just did a quick search yesterday on LinkedIn and um, found you know all these alums at at these various um, you know marquee you know legacy brands and, and new media brands and I encourage you to do that it's it's a lot of fun when I when I made this uh, document um, I wasn't paying attention to bloggers or unpaid you know interns or or part timers or freelancers this was this was pe people who had full time jobs and that's why I li limited limited this this information to so. No matter where news breaks, Columbia grads are there. And there has been so much news in the last month that you know, we've been seeing our grads just at the, at the forefront of all these major stories since, since the beginning of this huge news rush that we've had in, in, uh, in the last few months. So um, take um, Paulina Villegas. She was uh, a class of 2010 grad, but I want to tell you about her very briefly. She was from Mon um, Monterey, Mexico. She had only had eight months of newsroom experience before she got to the journalism school. She was working for a small digital news publication in, in Monterey, Mexico, and she came here. And after J School, she went to Grupo Clarín, which is a big news organization in Argentina, and she worked there for the summer. They didn't offer her a job. She went straight back to, me to Mexico City, and she joined up with her old company, um, the uh, Indigo Media. And she was there for a, uh, a little bit. And then in 2013, the bureau chief in Mexico City of the New York Times um, said that he was looking for a researcher and it needed to be a Mexican citizen. So there would be no you know, red tape with, with her work, work authorization. And that's how um, Claudia ended up at the New York Times. And she has been, you see her byline on every major story out of Mexico City, Mexico, um, from the last, last few years. Meanwhile, Hurricane Irma. Uh, we had so many students covering this hurricane from Houston to Jacksonville to Savannah. And Isabella Gomes was in the MA science program last year. And she had been, she really had very little journalism experience. She had done a little bit of freelancing. She had mostly worked in the public health sphere. She thought she was going to be a doctor. So she was doing internships in, in public health clinics and nonprofits and she did a little bit of freelancing and she came here to to learn to learn how to write about health and environment and she took this this six month fellow uh, ta uh, staff writing fellowship at the Miami New Times to learn how to do long form narrative and get some long stories under her belt and then the hurricane happens and it's an all hands on deck kind of situation. Somebody asked about collaboration. Well, when there are big breaking stories, everybody pitches in no matter what your beat. And so she ended up 
wading in flood water like everybody else, doing some stories. And then as, as, the, as the water receded, she began to do all the health-related stories, the whether the, how, how the, the water was dangerous and you know, the, the energy, the, I mean, the electricity running out, you know, posing risk to people. So she has been sort of doing you know, breaking news, science-related stories down in Miami. Here's um, Darius Johnson, who was uh, from Chicago, and he was, he's in Savannah, WSAV is in Savannah, Georgia, and his goal after, uh, out of J school was to be an on-air reporter. He had been a sort of a breaking news, uh, news aggregator at CNN. He was very fast and speedy, but it was, CNN was exciting, but it was in the office, and he wanted his after J, J school job to be outside in communities on air and so he, he got a couple different job offers and he took this one and sure enough you know Irma happens and he was out there again you know wading through flood water interviewing people finding out where they're going for food etc so uh, meanwhile last weekend um, we opened the news and it's you know Las Vegas so right away I went to the LA Times because that's my hometown newspaper. I'm from California and I wanted to see how the Times was covering it and immediately I see Aline, you know, Aline is the one who has been rushed, rushed to the scene in Las Vegas and is reporting and her, her byline has been on almost all the stories from the, from the LA Times out of the Las Vegas um, shooting. She was a 2010 grad who had no journalism experience except for editor-in-chief of the Daily Bruin which is the UCLA student newspaper and she had been at the, pap at the student newspaper for all four years of college, and then she came directly to J School after, after that. After, call after J School, she wanted to return to California. She sort of um, couldn't find a job like immediately, and she got an internship in the fall at the LA Times, and she's been there ever since. So um, that's, what, that's what happened. So that, you know, that's basically all I wanted to, to talk to you about today if there is if we might have a little time for some questions about traje job trajectories or anything that you might want to know about jobs if there's a little time yes well what do you mean so freelance Yes. True. There are there are people that choose to, to be freelancers uh, because they love the freedom of it. It doesn't pay particularly well, um, but some students really want to do it. Uh, and and we you know we we do have successful you know freelancers out there. I would say most of our students don't do that. They get a job in a newsroom, um, and so that's that's how it happens. I mean, ideally, you become a freelancer after you've established your name. And then, because if you have a name already, then you can ask for more money for each story. Does that doesn't answer your question? No. Yes, I mean, we've got... We've got a lot of, like I said, a, a lot of our students do freelancing, especially abroad. Um, students who want to be, you know, foreign correspondents, and oftentimes it's a freelance arrangement. And you know, pr we have a huge al alumni network of people who have done it successfully, or who have done it for a bit and then gotten a full-time job. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question exactly, but you know, okay, yes. Yeah, I was, <laughs> it's loud. <laughs> okay. um, I was wondering, do you see uh, different placement rates for students who enter journalism school where they had no experience prior to doing journalism school versus someone who has one to two years of experience? And do you do anything special with those students in terms of trying to get them up to speed and accelerate for uh, when they're actually going to apply? Well, there's a huge group of, uh, there's a large section of this every student, er, every class that is coming straight from undergrad. So our, our services really are very much geared towards you or whatever level you're at. I mean, someone who's just out of J school, 
just out of undergrad, may not be competitive for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, but there are tons of things that you are competitive for. Um, and I don't know what you've done in your summers. If you had, you know, internships and newsrooms all along, then then you'll be you'll be competitive. Everybody comes in at a different level, and everybody finds finds um, their own, you know, sweet spot. Uh, we we meet you where you are. We we definitely are extremely hands-on. It's not like undergrad where you probably never even visited your, the career office. We're all over all over you like a wet blanket. You get we get to know each and every person. Yes. Hi, um, I have a question. According to the uh, to the journalism classes, like how many how many percent of students are are the international students actually? I mean. The, how many of them uh, international students? And from the last graduation, uh, did uh, did the did the international students usually were uh, offered uh, a job by uh, U.S. agencies, U.S. media agencies? And how many of them got the job offer? Okay, so international students make up. 35 to 40 percent of the of the class. Uh, there's about 100, 105, 110 international students in this year's class, as I am uh, pretty sure, and uh, out of like 250 MS, and and then about 65 percent of the MA class is, is international. The international students have have extra challenges. There's no question. It is harder for an international student to find an internship here. Internships are the most likely outcome for, for everybody, and this is not particular to the J school. This is particular to the journalism world after you finish, finish your education. Um, our students will go into internships and then parlay that into, into jobs. There are other hurdles for international students. You get, you get a one-year OPT for your each degree that you earn, and you're allowed to stay for a year and work in a newsroom. Being sponsored, getting somebody to sponsor you so you can stay here forever is it very rare and is not likely. Um, we have heard lately a lot of students getting something called the O visa. Have you heard of the O visa? It's sort of the artist special and special talent visa. It's expensive, but you can, you know, it's, it seems to be um, successful if you're applying in New York City. Uh, but like I said, it's unusual to get sponsored long term. Most international students do go back to their home countries, or they leave the U.S. I, sh I should say, and go where go wherever they want um, after after the year is up, or or maybe even before the year OPT year is up. But then they go back, and then they get really great jobs because the the Columbia brand is really powerful in in, in other countries. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Gina, thank you very much. Um, I know we're running a little bit late here, um, so we're going to try to go very quickly through the admissions information and the all-important financial aid information. Um, I am going to first do a little announcement. Lost and found sunglasses that were left in the back of the room. If they're yours, you can collect them in the back at the end. So, admissions. What do you have to do for applying? What kinds of students are we looking for? Um, 
What do you want to do to get yourself in? You heard some comments from the faculty, um, some kind of general comments. I'm going to start and say generally we look for a number of things. It is not GRE scores. Um, unless you are applying to the dual degree with engineering where they value G GRE scores, or if you're applying to the, law the dual degree with law where they value LSAT scores or business where the GMAT, um, they're looking for the GMAT or SIPA where they're looking for the GRE. So dual degree programs, you're going to have to take a test. If you are applying solely to one of the master's programs, so either the 10-month MS, the part-time MS, or the MA program, or the data journalism program, the 12-month MS in data journalism. No tests. Don't take the GRE for us. Don't spend your money that way. The faculty are allergic to those tests because they don't believe that it's, it, it has any bearing or influence in telling us who's going to be a good journalist. What they're looking for, rather, good writing skills. Okay, whether you have journalism experience or not, they are looking for good writing skills. That's their top criteria or criterion. They are also looking for qualities that we know make a good journalist. So things like um, curiosity, persistence, determination. Remember what uh, Dean Coronel was saying about um, when you're going after wrongdoers. That really requires a lot of persistence. When you're going after stories where people don't want to talk to you. Um, so we're looking for people who have that persistence and that determination to get the story. Um, we're looking for people who love storytelling. Journalism is storytelling, regardless of the type of journalism that you're doing, whether it is a profile, a feature story, whether you're doing a political article, a business article, a science article. You're telling stories, and you're taking characters who are going to be at the center of your story to help tell the larger story that you're trying to convey. So we're looking for people who want to tell stories in a journalistic fashion, people who want to be journalists and tell journalistic stories, people who want to do creative writing, or if they tell me they want to do creative nonfiction or nonfiction writing. The School of the Arts, you can see it right across here, right through the trees. They've got great MFA programs in those areas, as well as in documentary filmmaking for kind of the creative side as opposed to journalism. So we're looking for people who love storytelling, um, journalistic storytelling. And then lastly, I think you heard especially from our students, we're looking for people who are passionate about journalism. It's the only thing that we do here. You know, we've got some computer science, we've got data, we are incorporating all of these kinds of things into the journalism that we do here. Those kinds of knowledge and skills, though, are being used in the service of journalism, in the pursuit of journalism. So passion for journalism, it's very painful to be here if you're not passionate about journalism, uh, because that's all anybody wants to talk about here. So those are the things that we're looking for in the students, both the MS and in the MA students. Um, and I'm going to kind of leave it at that because I think that the faculty addressed some of the other things that they're looking for specifically um, for their programs. The application. The application is open. The admissions application is open. Um, deadlines. You'll find all of these on the website. They're all clearly marked for each program. The full and part-time MS program, December 15th. The data journalism MS program, December 15th. The doctoral program, 
in communications, December 15th. The MA program, January 9th. The dual degree program in, with computer science, January 15th. That program's an outlier because you apply for that program through the engineering school and we're using their deadlines for that. The other deadlines are specifically for the journalism programs. Um, if you are applying to a dual degree program with business, law, SIPA, or religion at the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, you'll file two separate applications, one to journalism, one to the other school. They'll be considered by two separate faculty committees which will make their decisions individually with the exception of the dual degree with computer science and that has a joint um, committee, a joint admission committee that Professor McGregor also sits on. Um, that, pro that committee decides together. So best thing to look at for as far as deadlines read the website information carefully, read the application instructions carefully. What's in the application? Fortunately, all of you have gotten through undergraduate school. Some of you have already done graduate degrees. So the application to college or to university is not a mystery. The application is online. It is only online. Um, it starts, well, what I would say first is think about the application as you're telling a story about yourself and you're reporting about yourself. This is your first chance to give us a signal about the kind of reporting and writing that you do. So the first thing is all of that data. You know, as a reporter, you have to get the name, address, contact information of the person that you're talking about reporting on, well, we do the same thing in admissions. So there's a sheet that you'll be filling out with basic contact information, give us information about who your recommenders are, basic things like that. The other pieces of the application, your resume. You'll do two essays for all applications. One is a personal essay, the second is a journalism essay. So about your interest in journalism, about why you think you're a good match for journalism as a profession, and why you're a good match for what we do here at Columbia. We know that many of you are looking at many other journalism schools too. Um, and all of our colleagues do some different things, so there are different opportunities at the different schools. Um, we want to know that you understand what we do here at Columbia and that you have thought about why it's a good match for you. This is good practice because this is what you need to do once you graduate and are looking for jobs. You've got to make those same arguments in your cover letter for the jobs. So start thinking about it now. If you are applying to one of the specialization areas, whether in the MS or in the MA, you will write a third essay. So investigative, documentary, arts, business and economics reporting, politics, science, health, and technology. Any of those, you'll be writing a third essay about your interest in those areas. For the people who are applying to the MA program, you do not need to have an undergraduate degree in the specialization that you're choosing. Um, you do not necessarily need to have done a lot of writing in that area, but you need to have a strong interest and you need to feel like that's the next direction that you want to take your journalism in. Um, so think about those things carefully. You want to think about how you want to present yourself. These essays are your first chance to show us how you write. We assume that your essays will have been edited, so just keep that in mind. That's our assumption um, that, yes, you wrote those, but somebody else will have looked at them and said, hey, you 
have a typo here, a spelling mistake here, you forgot punctuation here. Um, be very careful. You're applying to a journalism school. Spelling, sentence structure, paragraph structure, punctuation, they all count. They all count. They're all important. We pay attention to it as we're reading your essays. So that's your first chance to let us know what your writing is like. Second chance to let us know, you have to submit clips. So basically, for the most part, most people are submitting written clips, three of them. People who have journalism experience, we are looking for journalistic clips. People with some journalism experience, maybe coming directly out of undergraduate school and have done student journalism, you can do a combination of things. You can do perhaps a very short paper, like three pages, that you wrote for a class that you feel really shows research that you've done, investigations, but really is a good example of your writing. Um, you can use something that you wrote for your college newspaper. Um, you can use a blog if you're keeping a blog. If you're going to use blogs, you want to use a blog that has a purpose and where you have been contributing to it on a regular pa basis and a blog that shows perhaps that you've done some reporting and thinking and research about what you're writing about. People sometimes, especially people who don't have experience with journalism, um, you know, we all like to give our opinions. Um, we're not looking necessarily for opinion pieces as a part of the application because what we're looking for is evidence of your reporting and writing skills. So keep that in mind as you're thinking about your um, clips. People who are applying to documentary should submit video clips plus the script behind it should be a video that you've done. And actually, for all of the print, it should be pieces that you have done yourself. These should not be collaborative pieces. We're looking for your work. We want to know what your work is like. Um, people who are interested in audio can also submit audio clips if they've been working in radio. Um, if they did student radio work, audio clips are very appropriate, again, with the script you should have written the script. Um, other possibilities, we, as um, one of our previous speakers mentioned, we have people who come to us who have no journalism experience, have been working in completely other fields. Um, so the physicians, the lawyers, true story, the boxers, ballet dancers, farmers, um, the people who come from the military, accounting, all of these other professions where people did the practical thing first or they did what their parents thought was best first, um, all for really good reasons, but they could not get rid of that feeling that they really wanted journalism. But you don't have clips. So a couple things you can do. For people um, who are working perhaps in marketing, PR, finance, financial analysis, you all do a lot of writing. You know, you're doing country analyses, you're doing company analyses, you're doing all kinds of things like that. There are things, there will be pieces that you have done at work that you can use for this. And you can get in touch with us and consult with us about what would be appropriate for that. We had a guy um, who actually was sitting in your seats actually at the November info session um, who worked at Goldman Sachs. He was really tired of Goldman Sachs and was ready to become a journalist. He used pieces, analytical pieces that he had done for work um, as his writing samples. Um, and I will say that he came and became the student body president and is now working at Bloomberg. 
um, there are lots of really nice opportunities for career changers as well, even though that seems scary. There are great opportunities, just as there are for people who have come directly through a journalism track. Transcripts. We need copies of your transcripts. You didn't hear me say anything about grade point average yet, and I'm not going to say a whole lot about it, except to say that grade point average is not the most important thing. I've been working here for 11 years and not been asked what's the average grade point average of the admitted class or the entering class or the graduating class. Columbia Journalism School does not use grades. We use a pass-fail system here. Um, so grades from your undergraduate work or prior graduate work, while they're important, they're not the most important thing. Your writing and those other qualities that I described, those come first. Things that we look at on transcripts that you can think about, and especially if you're still in undergraduate school, we're looking certainly at your grades in the English courses, in every course that you took where you might have done writing, um, because we want to see what happened in those courses. If you're applying to data, um, we're going to be looking at whether you might have taken a stats course or an operations research course or a research methods course. Um, they're not required, as um, uh, Professor McGregor said, but we'll be looking to see if you have any background like that. And I will say that for any journalist, any journalist at all, an undergraduate stats course and an undergraduate computer science course, very, very useful. In admissions and financial aid, I had no idea I was going into admissions work. I really should have taken a statistics course and a computer science course as an undergraduate. Too late to do anything about it um, or much about it at this point, but very valuable no matter what you're doing. Um, so we're looking, though, at grades in courses where there might be some influence in how you write, how you think, how you take large bits of information, analyze it, and synthesize it. So we'll look at that and think about that when we're looking at the writing test for the MS program. There is a writing test. Somebody asked a great question. Somebody in the audience asked a great question about it, and our students pretty much answered that, so I'm not going to spend time on it. Um, but that's another piece of information that tells us about your writing skills. So we've got your essays, your clips, and your writing test. The essays and the clips, we assume, have been edited. The writing test, you're sitting down and writing this in 90 minutes. And it's three separate sections, 30 minutes each. Um, that shows us what happens when you have to sit down and just do it. Something like what might happen in a newsroom. Um, and we consider that to be your real writing. Don't let the writing test scare you. This is just like going in and taking a final um, in undergraduate or graduate school where you have to sit there, look at the questions that are being asked, think about how you're going to structure re your responses, and write it. That's all it is. You've done this before. You can do it again. What am I leaving out? Um, recommendations. We require three letters of reference. Who are good references? People that you have worked for, people who have supervised your work in any sort of fashion. So who are those people? Professors, editors, other bosses, we're looking for people who can comment on your likelihood of succeeding at journalism school and also as a journalist. How do you help your recommenders to give you the best possible recommendations? It's 
been five years since you had them in the classroom. You've stayed in touch every now and again. You worked for them three years ago. Once you've contacted them ahead of time to ask if they can give you, you know, to explain what you're going to be doing, say, would you feel able to give me a positive letter of recommendation for this? They've said yes. In your thank you email, you attach your journalism essay and you attach your updated resume, all of which you've already checked for typos, spelling, all of that. You attach that saying, I know it's been a while since we've been in touch. Here are some things, you know, just to help you understand what I'm planning to do and what I've been doing since I was last in your classroom or since I last worked for you. That will help them structure their entire letter. Because when you're doing your application, you're putting together your story and you're structuring it and you want to structure it in the best possible way. So help everybody to help you do that. International students who are coming from non-English speaking university systems. So notice that I said university systems and not countries. International students who have done their university level studies in a language other than English must take either the TOEFL or the IELTS. So we accept the American English testing system from the Educational Testing Service. We also accept the British Council um, testing system as well. We are looking for a 114 TOEFL score. It's the highest TOEFL requirement of any program here at Columbia University, including all of the PhD programs. We look for an 8.0 on the IELTS. Why? You're coming here and you're doing, for the most part, either a 10-month Master of Science or a nine-month Master of Arts program. There's no time for remediation. You've got to be able to absolutely hit the ground running with your English, so we're looking for great English skills. Um, if anybody has questions about any of that, you can either email us in the admissions office or talk with us later. So what if you are a native speaker of Chinese, French, um, Swahili, Spanish, but you went to an English language university. If you've done your entire bachelor's degree at the English language university, you do not have to take the TOEFL or the IELTS unless you're applying to the PhD program in communications. They require the TOEFL or the IELTS regardless. Did I leave anything out for the application? I think I've hit all the application pieces. Does anybody have any questions about the application? Any quick questions? No questions. Yes. The question is, because you have to attach clips or articles or things, evidence of your work, would a, a political speech that you wrote count? That could be an interesting possibility. It could be an interesting possibility. Again, keep in mind that what we are looking for is evidence of work that you have done that is reporting and writing, and that's entirely your work and not anybody else's work. And so I say that because sometimes with political speech writing, there can be more than one person who's contributing to it. Um, but if it's your original draft, yes, that, I think that would work. Yes? So
so for the letters of reference, the question is, does it matter who they're from? So three employers, three faculty members that you studied with, what are we looking for? If you're coming directly from undergraduate school and you have no student journalism experience and no internship experience in journalism, yes, three faculty references, very appropriate. If you have been out for eight years from university, having three editors or three supervisors who supervised your work right for you is absolutely appropriate, absolutely appropriate. Sometimes there will be people who, and this is what we see most often, might have been out of school a year or two, have a year or two of job experience, then you might want a combination. Faculty, editors, or other people who have supervised your work. So it really depends on your individual situation. Yes? Right. The question is, what if the person you're asking to write a letter of reference for you is not a journalist? What if they come from business, from not-for-profit, they do something else? This is another place where you help them. You let them know what the program is that you're going to be doing, something about the courses, something about what it is that you understand that the journalism school is looking for in a strong candidate. The information's all there on the website. It's all there. Make use of it. You know, give them a page that says, this is what I'm looking to do. These are qualities that I know that the school is looking for. Help them to be able to, to do that. Most, most people who write letters of reference are able to pull those things together, but the more help you give them, the better off you'll be. Others? Yes? A segment with context would be fine. Um, it's unlikely that they'll watch the full half hour unless it's absolutely like dynamite, but um, I would say three to five minutes, and then they'll be interested in how you edited it. Yes? Question about the resume. Resumes come in different sizes, shapes, colors, academic resume, journalistic resume, engineering res resume, government resume. What are we looking for? Use whatever is the type of resume that you do. It doesn't matter to us. We also understand and recognize that resumes in different countries are different from resumes in the United States. Um, do whatever is most appropriate given where you are right now. Other questions? Yes. I would say three pages, um, certainly no more than five. If, you know, like if it's an academic writing sample. Um, if it's a paper that was 50 pages long, the abstract that you did for it is appropriate. Yes? If it's a published piece, would we be able to just provide the link or should we have, do you have to get a PDF? 
I would include both the link as well as the PDF. Yeah. If it's a published piece, that was the question for the people on the live stream. If it's a published piece, what should you include? If it's a book, should we just send you the book? That's a great question, actually. Um, we would prefer to have something short about it. You can send the book to us, but because the application is completely electronic and we do all of the reading online, we're not going to be distributing the book to all of the people who will be reading. So better, I think, to have an abstract again or the forward to the book, the prologue, something like that. Yeah, but that's a great question. Other questions? Edwin's shaking his head at me and saying, we got to stop. OK, I'm going to stop. Thank you all very, very much for coming. Um, Edwin, Taryn, and I are here. We will answer any questions that you have. Um, we won't leave until we answer all your questions. Um, but feel free to chat with us individually. And there will be some times where we'll listen to what you say and we'll say, let's make an appointment and talk about this. Because there are some of your questions that require more in-depth discussions and, and answers. So thank you very much. Um, we look forward to talking with all of you further. Bye now.